if you apply measurement to the very beginning of your video production process, you will get better outcomes and you will get better business results and you will get a much better return on your investment. Joining me this week is Steve Garvey, and we're going to delve into the world of data. Because I believe if you don't measure any content that you create, then what is the point? And how do you know it is going to work? Welcome to the Simon Says Video Podcast with your host, me, Simon Banks, where we talk about all things video and how this powerful medium can help you grow your business. We focus on how you can get a return on any video content you create. We talk about strategy, production, content, distribution, marketing, how you can get visible, gain new leads and get new clients. And now on with the show. Thanks, Steve, for joining me on the show. I'm really excited about this episode where we're going to delve a little bit deeper into data and how we can get a return of investment on video. But for the benefit of our listeners, can you tell me a little bit more about you? Yeah, sure. Hi, this Simon. It's uh, fantastic to be here today. And uh, yeah, I've been around in this sector for a very long time. Uh, I won't tell you how long because it's slightly embarrassing, but a very long time indeed. So in my background, I've worked uh, in broadcast TV. I started off as a film editor, so I was trained in film before film was then replaced by video. Uh, and since then, I've run uh, brand film production agencies, including the largest one in Europe. Uh, I've also been a director of communications, and this particular project is really about video research. Well, what I really like about you, Steve, it was just similar. You, you started off running agencies, probably primarily focused on producing films for brands. But we've been talking for a long time over the years about the importance of getting return of investment. And, and it's what I constantly call the missing link is about actually connecting the film you make to some data to work out if actually the video actually works. And I know this is the project you've been working on. But before we go into more detail, I mean, just just explain to me, you know, what trends are you seeing with video? Because I know you've been in the industry a long time. What are you seeing at the moment? I mean, there are loads and loads of trends, and the trends actually vary from economic sector to economic sector. Um, but overall, in terms of trends, we saw a huge increase in usage of video, which we could measure um, around the time of the pandemic, which is not surprising, uh, with the absence of live events. Uh, I think we've seen that use stay high, uh, it has maybe declined a little bit over the course of 2022 as live events have returned to some degree. But I think what you've seen there in terms of a trend is a really big shift of uh, both um, audience behavior uh, and brand communications behavior, whereas before it might have been something which was seen as being mm, an optional extra, maybe something like that. Do we really need to do video with this? Or is it too technically complicated to do it, particularly if it's going to be live? And what we now have is it's taken as given that it has to be part of pretty much every campaign. And I think although that was happening already, like many other things with the pandemic from 2020 onwards, uh, the pandemic really drove that home to be a permanent embed and change of behavior. No, I think it's definitely the pandemic accelerated the, the use of videos. I, I felt in, in my experience running an agency, a lot of large organizations a little bit shy of using video at times, but I think this has forced them into doing it. I'm seeing the trend I'm seeing is actually when we're doing events, particularly we're now streaming them at the same time, which actually, you know, will reach a wider audience. But just go back to seeing organizations using uh, um, video. I mean, I felt some organizations were a little bit reluctant to using video, maybe because they found it complex or may maybe it will sound expensive. But you know, let's go back to the basics of so why should organizations be using video? What's so good about video? Video of um, you, you basically have three types of media that you can use for brand communications and corporate communications. You've got text based materials, you've got image based materials which, where you could include still graphics in there as well. That, as well and then you've got moving images of various kinds which of course includes various types of animation of which there are many and live action uh live streaming pre-record etc etc the most important difference between uh video images and text is the video is the one that most closely replicates the experience of human face-to-face -face communication if the audience can't be there face to face or even if the audience can be there face to face, but it's a very large audience, then video does the same thing. It gets you as close as you can possibly get 
to a conversation, a direct conversation between two people or a small group of people. And that's really, really important. The reason being that we as humans are hardwired to pick up millions of signals every few seconds uh, about what's going on in the world around us. Our eyes are built that way, our brains are built that way, everything about us has evolved that way. Now what video does is if you can't be in the same room and talking to someone, video is the closest possible connection to that. So you've got most of the stimuli that the brain wants to pick up the information that it wants to know about a person. For example, do I feel that I can trust them? With the written word, a good writer will be able to communicate trust, but it's not that easy. With a still image, you can also go one step further. But with video, our brain is picking up multiple pieces of information all the time about things like tone of voice, facial expression, uh, speed of speech, and so on and so forth, which subconsciously we will process into forming a view relatively quickly about whether we trust that person. And only video can achieve that. I mean, that's why it's such a... Well... We're, maybe we're a bit biased, but that is why it's such a powerful medium to to, to use. Um, and I sort of think, you know, I think any business should be looking at how you can use video across across all your sort of customer journey, you know, in terms of awareness, in terms of sales, in terms of onboarding, in terms of motivation of, of teams and staff. I mean, there's so much you can do with video and we're not necessarily going to go into the actually what types of video that you should be creating um, but the fact is you should be thinking video but I want video to talk about is how can we get results with video how can we measure video I think a lot of businesses miss a trick here when they're not really tracking the video they're doing they tend to just create a video they might put it on their intranet they might put it on their website they might put it on social media channels and that's it we don't tend to, to look respectively or retrospectively on, on how it's performing. I mean, so, so why is it important that we should be measuring video? I think it's really, really important for multiple reasons. One of those is that video will often be a bigger slice of your content budget than other types of media. It's simply relatively expensive to produce, although those costs have come down a lot in uh, recent years. So shouldn't you be applying the same kind of metrics to return on investment that you would to to any other form. I think sometimes there's a sense in that some brand communications professionals would see video as just something you have to have for a given type of campaign and they'll do it anyway. And they won't necessarily expect the same kind of metrics back. But that's probably a reflection on the type of measurement that we do and the type of tools that we have available. There isn't really any reason why you can't measure video just as effectively as any other form of content. Uh, and that's what we're aiming to do with the work that we're doing now. I mean, what kind of things can we measure with video? What kind of data can we get? We get a huge amount of data. I mean, it's almost the problem with data you've got is there's so much of it, you know, where do you start? So I'll give you one particular example. One that people often focus on is how long should my video be? Really simple question, right? And a standard, um, standard response to that, if you Google it, you'll probably find this response, um, is that it should be short. Um, the actual duration of that shortness will depend on whichever blog post you're reading. But if you track it back, very little data is ever revealed to support the thesis that your video should be short. It's normally actually driven by the fact that most of the social media platforms, which provide most of the metrics which most brands look at, particularly agencies on the social media side, those brands will generally classify a relatively short video play as being a view or a play. Therefore, it counts, right? And everybody wants a large number of views or plays. But does that really engage the audience? If it's viewed for three, four, five seconds, does that actually make any difference to the audience's perception? So that's a really good example where you can actually measure that. It is measurable. But my feeling was, uh, I only set this business up, not because I particularly felt it was my mission to do so, but because nobody else had done it and I couldn't find out the information that I wanted to find. So we can come back to the duration one if you want, but that's just one simple example where you can say, and I'm afraid the answer is, it doesn't have to be short. It's just, uh, well, I, I just cannot evidence it. I've tried, I, I'd be really happy if I could, because it would be great, but I just can't find evidence to support that thesis. Well, the same, because most platforms of you could be three seconds, right? If you're talking about YouTube, it's what, 30, 30 seconds? Uh, I know a lot of platforms like Facebook and YouTube and probably your platform, you know, you can, what's what we call watch time, right? So how long do people watch content for? Now, generally, generally the, the graph is most people, like only 20% of people might watch to the end of your video, which is why suddenly 
oh, we need to have shorter videos, right? I mean, there's this argument that shorter is the better. We've all got short attention spans. So you're saying that's not actually true, that actually people will watch longer content. I guess the argument is it does depend on what the content is and how engaging it is to get people to watch. Do you think attention spans are getting shorter or is it, or is it just well, the way we're consuming media these days? I mean, we take a pretty scientific slash academic approach to this. I'm not really interested in writing marketing blog posts, which is actually when you start searching online, that's mostly what you're going to get when you look for this kind of material. I'm interested in actually using ac um, more research driven, um, uh, kind of methodology where you declare your results, you open them for inspection and so on and so forth. I've never actually found any evidence yet that anyone's revealed, which is convincing as to uh, why your video should be short to take that particular um, example. And when you think about it just logically, I can't see how it would stand out. Why do people watch box sets over a weekend if they only watch short videos? It makes absolutely no common sense whatsoever. It doesn't fit with human behavior. It's all driven by those social media metrics that I was just talking about. But also, just to take your example there, let's say that 20% of your audience does watch your film through to the end. Let's say it's a three-minute film for the sake of argument. Is that a bad thing? Well, it depends on who those 20% are. It depends on your script. Let's say, for example, you've got a key message that you want to deliver, and you deliver that in the first eight seconds of the film, and 90% of the audience watches the first 10 seconds. Well, you've got your key message out there, so that's a result, right? Secondly, the people who watch to the end, the 20%, are going to be those who really engage with your message and want to find out more. And you've kept them interested for three minutes in that particular case. If you've got a call to action, which is embedded in your script, particularly towards the end of the video, and then X percent of those move on, then that video, even though, as shall we say, only 20% of them have actually watched it to the end, that is a very good result for that piece of investment. So I think it's way oversimplified. And if anybody ever says to me, your video should be short, I say, it's really interesting. Can you show me some evidence for that, please? And I'm very interested, genuinely, I'd love to see some evidence, and no one has ever shown me any yet to support it. So I would say instead, it's a much more layered message. It's around, yeah, you don't want to put your logo up for the first five seconds, uh, unless there's a particular reason to do so. You do need to attract people's attention in the first three to five seconds. You do need to, you do need to say something about your key message in the first three to five seconds. But that does not follow through in any way logically to mean that your whole film should be short. Is there an optimal length for them? So you, you're kind of looking at the wrong end of the telescope. It's, it's the wrong question to ask, with all due respect, because I know it's one that people do ask. You need to start at the other end of the process. First of all, what business goal do you want to achieve? I assume that's clear in your campaign, otherwise why are you doing the campaign? Secondly, what is your message tree or your message pyramid to achieve that goal? Thirdly, what is your customer journey to achieve that goal? So with those three things in place, you can start to say, well then, do we need video, right? And perhaps you do, I don't know. I'm not particularly here to try to persuade people to use video. All I'm trying to say is that if you apply measurement to the very beginning of your video production process, you will get better outcomes and you will get better business results and you will get a much better return on your investment. So if you've got those three things in place that I mentioned just now, that is your business goal, your uh, message period, your message pyramid and your customer journey. So that's clear. Then you say, OK, what kind of film do we need? And we, you'll probably end up with more than one edit. You'll probably end up with a short edit because it serves a particular purpose. It might act as a sting in a live event, for example, to go between sessions or it might add as just a tease. It might work as just a tease to go on whichever social media channels that you're using. But for the audience that wants to go on the journey with you, give them the longer version. And then it depends on the script and the outcome. So you're saying what we're aiming to do here is to communicate with people in such a way that they fulfill this action. What do we need to do with the film to facilitate that for as many people as possible who want to do it? You will then end up with your film. Probably it won't be longer than five minutes but that's not necessarily the case. Don't think about minutes. It's just not relevant. It's about outcomes. No, I love that. I was also talking to Stefan Christensen, which runs a platform called 23, and they were finding the same thing, that actually they were looking at even like 20 to 40 minute videos were also getting lots of engagement. And this is business to business films as well. So, so it is true. 
duration doesn't really matter. It really depends on the outcome and your audience and the messages that you need to get across. And the other point I picked up there is also what we call multi-purposing the video. So maybe you've got a longer form video, maybe you want to do a shorter edit to tease it, to promote it and point people to where the longer version is. And it's really important to have call to actions within the video because that's another way of, of actually measuring and tracking how successful the video can be. In terms of our data, what else can we get? So that's views. What else can we see? What else are you seeing with the data you're collecting? Well, we would always urge the clients that we work with to start with the concept of benchmarking. Because what you want to do is you want to measure where you are now and then whether you're getting better, right? Obviously, we assume that you've got your business goals that you want to achieve. So how would you benchmark? How would you measure where you are now? Well, that initial benchmarking exercise, like any other data or research exercise, will give us the foundation from which we're building. So let's say, for example, um, it's about recruitment because that's a very popular request that we tend to get. How does my brand perform? Well, presumably what you want to know is how does your brand perform against rival brands? So let's say you work in fashion retail, for the sake of argument, and you want to recruit people more effectively, get more of the right people to work in the stores and to work in your e-commerce business. Well, then what we would do is we would put together a basket of competitors with your agreement and maybe a couple of hero brands in, in there too that you really want to be like. And we would then say, well, let's look at those. We have a reference data set, which is pretty much certain to have at least some of your competitors in there as long as they're major brands. Um, and then we can pull that, we, we can pull data from that data set. Those, that goes back two years now, so we can reference history on that as well. But we would then tailor make that. So what you would then end up with is not a generic question like, how long should my video be? Although that's very interesting and people always want to talk about it, but actually it will be something which is tailored to your specific business need. We then do the research. We would build dashboards and provide written reports. That will shed a huge amount of light, not least of which is what your competition is up to. If they're better than you, because there's a chance that some of them are, if they're better than you, well, how do they do it? So you get loads and loads of feedback that comes out of that. Then normally what happens, it, it will involve in strategy. Either we'll help our client with that or they will do that work themselves. Um, and that strategy will then evolve into actual video production. So it's not a one hit wonder. It's not an exercise that you can do as a one off and then say, right, we've solved that problem. We definitely urge that the way to make this work is to set your benchmark first of all and then allow it to hum along gently in the background so you can dip into it at every time that you need it. No, I love that, the idea of actually benchmarking first, looking at your competitors rather than looking at everything at once. And I, again, I love, you know, not everyone wants to talk about strategy, but I think when it comes to any content creation, you need to have a strategy in place rather than just to sort of dive into sort of, oh, we need a video, let's make a video. So I just thinking that's a bit more long form, a long tail, I, I guess you can call it, in terms of thinking about it, analyzing first, doing an audit almost, isn't it? You're doing an audit on maybe what your current content is doing, comparing that to what your competitors are doing and, and to work out how you can improve your content as well. Yeah, definitely. I think, um, I think probably both you and I, Simon, we've lived through a generation where a lot of video production has been spontaneous. Uh, I, you, I don't know, maybe Simon, may, maybe all of your customers who come to you give you three months planning time to work with. Is, is that right? No. No. I thought you might say that. <laughs> no, it's, it's but, you know, I can think right now I've got a couple of shoots coming up next week and they're like, I'm, I'm still trying to get to the bottom of, okay, what is it we're actually doing? You know, they're like, they're going first with, oh, can you available this day for a shoot? And I go, yeah, we can organize that. But what is it we're doing and working? I like to work backwards. I like to start with the begin with the end in mind. And you're right. And I'm, I'm sure we can share lots of stories about how clients literally jump into production, which is why I'm actually doing this series of podcasts and videos. It's part of my mission is to go stop just jumping into production, but just think, slow down and think actually what results do we want to get with video? Because my belief is if we can measure the video, if you can actually see a return of investment, you're more likely to do more video, right? So, because it does work, we know it works. And this is what I'm excited about talking about you, Steve, because you're now 
analyzing this has become your mission, I guess, if you like it or not, to actually work out, you know, how, you know, how does video work and how can it benefit brands, particularly, which I know what you're focusing on at the moment. I mean, that's the whole thing, because I, I guess there's so much data that you can get and you are seeing, but I think that the important thing is things about what I call getting the data and what story does it tell? And it's linking the two. So from the data you, you are analyzing, and I think you're focusing more on platforms like uh, LinkedIn and Instagram, is that correct? Um, and so what, so what, what are you seeing so far? What stories are you discovering from what, what data you are currently, I guess, receiving or analyzing? Yeah, I mean, we get, absolutely, we get loads of data. Um, I think um, this is the thing that probably anyone who works in analytics, measurement, research, data, whatever you, word you choose to use for it, will probably tell you is that where do you start? What you effectively end up is with is a load of spreadsheets with a load of stuff in it and a load of columns. And you stare at it and it means nothing to anybody. So how do you make some sense of that? What we definitely find is that element about the data narrative. Um, it sounds weird. It sounds like it's made up. It's not. It's really, really true. It's a bit like authors who say that when they start writing their novel, their characters talk to them in their heads and they just write down whatever they say. It's the same kind of process. But it doesn't talk to you straight away. You have to work with it. You have to ask questions. You have to dive into it. You have to test theories. So the process that we work with here is that we will have weekly team meetings where we look at our regular reference data set and we will encourage debate about that. We would encourage people to watch random videos as well as the obvious ones, which you perform the best. We will then uh, get a team meeting together. We will then show the films or get people or make sure people have seen them before they come into the meeting. And they will, and then we will encourage everyone to speak in favor of a given film and just hear them ask why. Now there is no such thing as an objective judgment about what is a good video, right? Because whatever I think is good is gonna be different to yours and that will never get resolved. But you can say something is distinctive. You can say is something is innovative. You can say that something has generated a particularly large positive engagement from the audience for that particular brand in comparison to the work they've done before. So there are loads of things that you can analyze which are actually measurable. And when you start testing that thesis of diving into it, pulling ideas out, let's face it, half of them are going to go nowhere, but that's fine. The other half that end up standing up to general debate um, are the ones that generate the insight. So you have to throw that open. The other thing I've found with that is that the more consistently you do it, so not once a year, but every week and personally, we analyze here in our team about 100 videos a week uh, and I watch about 20 of them. So I'm watching a thousand videos a year maybe. And with that, you do obviously pick up a really broad sense of anything, for example, which is very fresh, uh, a fresh style, a, a different method. When you start doing that, what you then start saying is, okay, here's a few ideas that come out of this and we've tested them. We've tried to, having created the ideas, we've tried to knock them down and these ones are still are still standing up. Those are your insights. Your insights then feed through into strategy. It's worth mentioning briefly about strategy. It sounds like a horrible word, right? It sounds like one of those things that the big consulting firms are going to charge you an absolute fortune for and it's just uh, millions of PowerPoints that don't really go anywhere anyway. Great for the consulting firm. Is it great for your brand? I don't mean that at all. What I mean is building accessible data tools, which are normally in the forms of dashboards and reports, which means that you can access the data that you need yourself and you can get the insights. Normally for our clients, we will also keep an overview of that and we will compare their data to other data that we're capturing either in the reference data set or for other individual clients. So we will always help with that but we want to build tools which are accessible. And back to your original point you were mentioning a couple of minutes ago, Simon, I think people haven't used video measurement much simply because the tools available to use it are just not very good. They just don't tell you much. I mean, well, I you know, okay, you can actually look at your favorite platform, YouTube or whatever, and there's a load of analytics in there. But is it really right for your brand? They're probably going to reference you back to influencers. Are you really comparing yourself to a YouTube influencer? Is, is that right for your brand? So uh, what we're trying to do is to make those tools really, really relevant to our clients anyway. I mean, what, that's what I really like about that is this is that I know you can get lots of numbers. So if you go, let's use YouTube, for example, um, you can download all the, all the data in terms of views and watch time and locations and 
and devices, whatever it might be. But then it becomes, you're right, most people, well, for me particularly, you know, you're looking at a, a spreadsheet of numbers and it's really hard to work out what is actually going on, which is what I love what you're talking about is, is actually we're not just looking at one particular video at one particular time. We're actually analyzing over time. And I think that's a key point to make here. It's about consistency. Consistent video content will make a difference in your business. A, if you're actually producing the video content, but then if you're actually analyzing it over time, which is what uh, your platform actually does. Now, can we have a look a little bit more detail about your yes, platform? Sure. Can we, can we, can you share some insights and, and something? Fine. So for those who are listening to the podcast, if you want to actually see what Steve is actually going to share with us, then you'll need to go to uh, a link that I put into the show notes to a YouTube video. But I'm just curious to, to see what actually that Steve can pull out for us. So if you want to share your screen. I certainly shall. Here we go. So this is obviously there's a million ways of looking at data, as we've already said. The point is to understand from the start what you want to learn out of it. Let's focus, first of all, on the effectiveness of video. And from that, you also get effective use of budget. If you follow the original e and with Ogilvy comic back in the 1950s, I think it was that I know that half of my advertising budget is wasted, but I don't know which half. You could, broadly speaking, apply the same or something similar to your video budget if you're not really measuring whether it works or not. How do you know whether it's worth investing in? So what we normally find with clients is that they change the way that they do their productions. They may end up spending less money on video, but typically that's not the outcome. What they normally do is they change the way they invest in video to make it much more effective. So this is one way that you can achieve this. There are many others which are data driven, but this is an easy one to access. So. This is one of our reference data sets. Uh, as you mentioned, Simon, uh, we primarily do Instagram and LinkedIn. So this is on your... This is on our platform, yeah. This is your platform which you've built. Yeah, this is. Um, this has taken about two years to build. The build of it um, has taken that long for the simple process that first we need to work out what we're trying to achieve with it. Secondly, we had to test it and then we had to make, make it as automated as possible. So the aim here is to produce something which is which gives you really valuable tools, but which does not cost the earth because we know brands are not gonna spend a fortune on video measurement unless they can see huge value in it. And then the way to demonstrate the value is to enable them to access really effective tools without spending a fortune. So this is what we've built here. So we, we've only started to show this publicly in the past few months because we wanted to be absolutely sure it works and we're now confident it, it does. So what you can see here, just a very quick summary. Uh, this is our 100 brands on LinkedIn in the second quarter of 2022. So three months worth of data. Uh, we track 100 UK brands. Um, we track those, the same brands on LinkedIn uh, and on, um, and on uh, Instagram. And when we do those, uh, we track every post that they make of all media types. And when we break them down into different media types, either image, text, or video. Now, the um, one that we're looking at here is LinkedIn. And at the moment, we've got four, um, four widgets across the top, which is some of the headlines that people like to see. Uh, the first one is who got the most reactions for LinkedIn videos, bearing in mind that LinkedIn reactions are pretty much all positive. There aren't any negative ones on LinkedIn. So all these reactions are going to be positive. And GSK won that with a fraction with only one under 42,000 reactions over the course of April, May and June of 2022. EY were the most active, posting a lot of videos, 59. Um, the average per brand posted per month is 5.4, so a little over one video per week. Uh, and the green widget there is Ineos Automotive. One thing that interests us a lot is, um, oh, it's great if you're GSK or EY, you've got a lot of followers, or in fact, if you're Unily, if you've got a huge number of followers on uh, LinkedIn, but maybe that just means that the absolute number that you get of positive reactions um, it's just because you've got a lot of followers. Maybe it's only a very small percentage of them. So we also measure the reactions per 1,000 followers with video. And here we see Ineos Automotive getting 142 per 1,000, which is pretty huge when you think that 14% of their audience will give them a positive reaction over the course of the uh, quarter. 
So um, those are the main widgets that come out of that. We've then got some tables and charts that go uh, into a little bit more detail below. I won't try and go through all of those now, but I will just show one as a little example. So what we're going to do is we're going to just pop out this particular one because uh, I think it shows a couple of interesting points. Um, and this is reactions compared to followers developing that point that I just mentioned. So this is all of our 100 brands plotted on a bubble chart. And the size of the bubble uh, is relative to the size of their following. So this giant bubble down here is linked in, as I just mentioned. They've got 17 million followers, or they did at the end of June. Anyway, they had 17 million followers. Now, if you look at these two axes, um, here we have total reactions, and over here we've got reactions per thousand followers. So we can see that certain brands do really well on getting more reactions than others. Um, here's EY, they do really well, post a lot of videos, but that generates a lot of a, a very high number of total reactions. And then also, if we go here to Monzo, they do really well with total number of um, total number of reactions too. But if we do it per thousand followers, you end up with a rather different picture. You still get Monzo standing out there, um, but you've also got down here, way over at the far side, you've got Landsec, who've only got a pretty small following, 18,000, but they did get a lot of reactions per, um, uh, per, per follower um, out, of this, out, of this, out of this particular season. Now, we would argue that ideally, as a brand, you'd want to be somewhere around there in the top right hand side which is a high number of total reactions and a high number of reactions per video but you can see that the vast majority of brands are way over here what does that tell you it tells you that really in comparison to the best performers most brands don't do that well we would probably like to see more of an even spread across this bubble chart uh, but the fact is that you know in terms of reactions per thousand followers uh, there's a bit of a gap there, so that's 21 or 22, I think, over to the right of where my cursor is at the moment. Uh, and that is a, um, uh, and these are the good performers who are getting over about 120 reactions per thousand. Uh, and then everybody else, particularly the ones over in this end, are not doing particularly well with the size of the audience that they've got per follower. So, and I think this is probably one of the reasons for this is they're probably not measuring results. They're probably just posting video seeing what happens, maybe talking about number of reactions or number of views they've got on LinkedIn and not going into it in any more detail. They're not feeding that back into saying, well, are we making the right kinds of videos? Is there a point to doing this? And so on and so forth. I should have one other point. This isn't critical of any brand because, of course, we don't know what their brand strategy is. So EY post a load of videos. But I don't know, perhaps their strategy. Um, and by the way, if I didn't know what EY strategy was, I wouldn't say it in public unless they give me freedom to do so. But maybe their strategy is always to be in the timeline. Uh, and in total, they do get a very large number of reactions. So we're, we're doing, so we're, we're looking here um, at one particular way of viewing the data. This is actually for all, for all, for all content, for all, for all types of post. Um, we can also feel this so that we do it just for the videos. But the point I really wanted to make here is that probably this chart shows you that there is, there's about 20, it's, it's roughly speaking the usual 80-20 rule, where about 20% of your sample are doing substantially better than all the others. And so, of course, those are the ones that we're looking at over on the right-hand side, to try to figure out why the likes of uh, Monzo up there um, or Aston Martin Lagonda are doing well. Of course, Aston Martin Lagonda have got a very desirable product, but is there something else about the way they do it? Because there are some brands in the rest of this chart which have really desirable products too, and they're not doing as well as Aston Martin Lagonda. So we tend to focus on those to look at best practice, then we feed that back in to the strategy questions. I know people might not want to talk about strategy, but it's really important, I think, to create content for your audience, depending on what platform they're on. So I, I guess the ideal is if you, it doesn't really matter, you know, obviously if you've got a large audience like Unilever or EY, you know, you can post a lot of content and you will get a number of reactions. But what I like is about the smaller brands is not such a big audience, but they're getting a lot of engagement. And, and I guess that is, that's what you really want to do, depending on the size of your audience, you want to make sure that they're engaging with your content. Now, whether that be video, uh, image, or, or even written posts. I mean, in terms of, let's talk about LinkedIn for a moment, is 
you know, what are the trends of LinkedIn? Are you, you know, is video effective on LinkedIn? I guess most uh, brands should have a strategy of posting sort of multiple types of content. But what are you seeing with video, particularly on LinkedIn? What we're seeing is that video is effective um, on um, LinkedIn. And here's a little chart to demonstrate that, uh, just to pick up on that particular point you just mentioned, Simon. Um, so um, here you can see um, that in comparison to um, images, we're getting we're getting more average reactions per video, about 85 in comparison to about 62 for images. Now, this is this particular quarter. Um, and it changes from quarter to quarter, but I don't think we've ever had a quarter where images get higher reaction per post uh, than um, than videos do um, across the average. Of course, the total amount, which is the blue, is going to be bigger for images than it is for videos because people post a lot more images than they than they do videos. Um, so, video is and and by that and by by that metric, it's reasonable to assume. I wouldn't apply a, like a percentage by which video is, as it were, more effective than images. But what we do see consistently, and I think without exception across all the days that we've ever seen, is that video gets a higher number of reactions on LinkedIn, for example, and this is true on others too, um, than images do across all the social media platforms that we've looked. Um, one of the anomalies here, which we don't show on this, um, is that we have the um, is that we have the um, change of um, uh, engagement between text and videos and images. One of the strange things is that text only posts do surprisingly well um, on LinkedIn. I don't really know why that is. They typically perform about as well as video does. I've no idea why that would happen to be the case. We've never looked into it, but there are very few text posts because normally people feel they have to post an image or a a video. So in terms of the trends, yeah, definitely video is more effective. I think video can typically justify the additional budget that it normally costs. Um, but we do think that the, um, you know, we, we aren't here to persuade people, as I mentioned earlier, to use video more, but we also think in this, you know, this is quite a good example here in the bubble chart that I just mentioned now, is that this chart suggests that not many brands are using measurement on their LinkedIn posts. We see this on videos across, the whole, across all content here. We see a similar spread of bubbles when we do this for, for, the, um, for the video only posts. Um, in terms of the video trends generally, um, it varies from platform to platform platform we're talking here um, about um, about LinkedIn and I'm just gonna show you this particular um, table because this one is all about video and I think you just mentioned there some of the uh, some of the smaller brands so I'm just going to show you here th these are the these are the high these are the high ranking ones in terms of video effectiveness so this comes back to the to the, to, to the trends point of view um, I think the main trend that you see about LinkedIn is that LinkedIn is a fantastic way to put pull together a professional community who are big fans of the work that you do. So if you look at the brands here who are in, say, the top five, you've got Ineos Automotive, Parkinson's UK, Tokamak Energy, who are a startup business who are developing nuclear fusion, Oxford Nanoport. Oxford Nanopore and Alzheimer's uh, in the UK. So those top five get more reactions per video um, than the other 95 brands in our sample. And with all those, I think they all have very strong brand loyalty with their audiences. In the case of Tokamak and Oxford Nanopore, it's people who love science. When you look at the comments that come up in their posts, they're very much driven by other professional scientists and researchers. Obviously, Parkinson's and Alzheimer's have a very strong and passionate following because of the charitable work they do. And Ineos Automotive and Aston Martin, who are in sixth place, have an extremely desirable product for their particular audience. So you can see there that, that they do much better than more generalist brands. Um, so LinkedIn is a really good place to attract that devoted professional audience. And if anything, we've seen that get reinforced over the pandemic for the simple reason that people are spending more time on LinkedIn and therefore more likely to follow the brands that they really like. 
but these brands are doing really, really well with video. I mean, if you're getting, you know, over 30 reactions per thousand typically with your video, then you're absolutely in the top 10%. Oh, well, yeah. So just to say that video does work if you're consistent with it and also posting content, which is relevant and interest to you, your audience as well. So it doesn't matter. You don't have to be the big brands to, to sort of smash it. And LinkedIn, it's all about creating content, which is going to resonate and engage with your audience. So, so what is your biggest uh, tips or, you know, what should be brands should be doing now um, when it comes to creating video content? I think the number one thing that brands should be doing is being aware of the effectiveness of the work that they do. And this is not said from the point of view of someone who's trying to persuade you that it is effective. You just need to do that initial benchmarking first. You need to take a really serious look at what works and what doesn't. Now, the thing is that within the business, everyone who works in comms or in brand marketing is familiar with the scenario where a, a senior figure within the business will approach you directly or one of their team will approach you and say, we need a video next week. It's not your fault that you have to deal with the consequences of that. Now, that results in a very fast production process where there's little time to think about anything. What we're suggesting here is to have a bedrock of measurement and understanding so that you have a simple strategy that says, yeah, we can do with that. Yeah, we can we can deal with that and it fits into our strategy this way. Here are some things that we need to do with this particular piece of content that you want me to make by next week, for example. So in other words, r rather than being a slightly more scattergun approach is, well, what can we do with this story? It's what can we do with the story using video in the context of what we already know and understand about particular platform that we're thinking of using. And that's where the measurement in the background constantly humming along really, really works. It saves you a load of time. It will save you budget and it will mean that it's less of a panic. If I can say that when you get that call or when you get that visit, someone coming up to your desk to ask you for that urgent turnaround job, you can be much more chilled about how you're going to respond to it. No, absolutely amazing. Steve, I want to thank you so much for your time. I know that we could talk for hours on this. For our audience, if they want to find out more uh, about what you're doing and particularly about the tools that you're using, where can we find you? Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn, uh, Steve Garvey, all the business is Moving Image. Uh, and online, we're at moving-image.video. You'll find a load of stuff on there. Uh, and of course, please do contact Simon. We'll be very happy to talk through Simon too, because uh, we don't do content. I, I've produced hundreds of videos, but I don't do that anymore. I'm only really interested in the research and the measurement side. So we definitely work very proactively with, with uh, good quality and experienced producers like Simon. I mean, and then that's the way it should be working really is looking at the co content creation uh, as well as the tools to measure it as well. Because I believe if, you know, you can make lots of video content, you can just put it online, but unless you're measuring it, you don't know what's really going on, if it's working or not, and potentially you're just going to waste a lot of time and money. So it comes back to my mission and Steve's mission really is about, before you think about any content, even the video, you've got to have a, an idea of what results you want first, who you're actually connecting with, and what results you want to get, and make sure that you measure them, that it's all about consistency over time. Thank you, Steve, for, for your time today. Um, I'm sure we'll, we'll do this again. Fantastic. It's been really good talking to you, Simon. And uh, yeah, I do hope we can do it again, uh, because believe me, this is just the tip of the iceberg that we've been talking about today. There is so much more that you can learn from this and apply back to your comms. So thanks for watching. There are many other episodes in the Simon Says video series where we take a deep dive on how you can be using video content to grow your business.